all this is dr mubeen sayed from drbeen.com welcome to one more show and today we have with us our own paul borg paul welcome thank you very much mubeen and take it away here is uh, your we have a slide up good so we're having more um more covid thought legal thoughts and uh First, let me do a real quick uh, review of the COVID stats. Uh, this chart is unchanged. I mean, you're think I think you're thinking I'm meaning it's pretty much the same. No, it's unchanged. The people that did it have stopped changing it because they don't have enough data coming in. And they say that it's being misrepresented. They've got fewer people and they're getting a lot more bias that people are reporting only when they're sick. And so we looked at the curve coming up here. And so the fact they stopped doing it says that they believe that they're not representing the true values in the UK because the UK, as you remember, uh, had, still has their police run around, grab people and randomly select, you know, measure. And so they have numbers, but that's late. And apparently that no longer is going on. So this number that we had coming up uh, over a month ago is uh, probably not nearly that high. But so we're not going to be getting any more data. I don't know that they're going to get that. So, so is that true for US as well? Remember in August, we were supposed to have a peak again and then the uh, more sensitive data will come, come up separ uh, separately. Did you ever have a chance to look at that? Um, yeah, no, I, I, I don't believe that we've, we've had that. I mean, the numbers that we have here, this is the last numbers from the CDC, which, uh, let's see, I can read I these. This so they're, they're sewing the test positivity down, the trend in, in percentage of emergency rooms that are COVID, you know, it's down 11%. Hospital emissions, 5%. COVID deaths are 4%. So I think the 0.75 four plus or minus is just bouncing around. It isn't a real change. The emergency room Understood. departure of 10% down, and it looks like their graph shows that it's coming, been coming down for a little while. That may be something of note, but that's pretty much all I saw. The, um, we have the, um, the ones we had before showed, you know, a five and 7% increase. So I think that just bounces back and forth. And um, so I, I think that, just like here, I don't right. think the peak was this high. It's probably down, and it's and it's bouncing around just the way we thought, sort of an exponential right. decay with the uh, noise around it. Now, last time uh, they gave up on over half the U.S. regions. The CDC. I just looked. They're back to predicting for seven regions, so they're getting a little more data than they had before. Last time, all these were um, growing. And they all were for the BA2, the XBB. Now we only have two of them growing and all the rest are decreasing. Some decreasing faster, some decreasing slower. But essentially we have two of them that now seem to be moving up in the overall U.S. versus the other ones that were going up that are now going down. And quick, quickly going to the next strain, looking at the mutation rate, it was down about 20% for the EG 5.1, and the other one that's going up is uh, the uh, HV 0.1, and that is probably down 20 to 25 percent from overall. So again, I, the, the data time frame is very short, so it's hard to predict. But it base, but certainly it's not showing anything is getting out of control or getting worse in terms of mutation rate, and if anything, it's getting better. But it's still uh, highly mutatable, and I think we'll continue to have that, you know, continue to have new variants come in and go forward. And I think we're, we're, we're seeing it adjusting more to people and people adjusting more to it. And I think we'll have the overall um, number of people decrease. And I think that's what the data shows here. And Go very ahead, thank you so much. Very quickly here to help people. This is the CDC's, how all, they, they relate all these different ones to their parents and whatever. The two that are in blue are the two that are growing. And see that the XBB and XB2, and they're in this XBB 1.9 group. They're, we're getting less variation than we had before. We're getting new variants, but it looks like it's pretty much 
getting in control. There's uh, curves or borders on it, and it's going back and forth, but it looks like it's not getting more out of control. And we may get a jump sometime, but uh, there's nothing to indicate that. So again, with the much more limited data, and I think we'll continue to see less data, there's nothing that shows that it's of any concern. And that's the, the summary I have. And now I can jump into the legal things unless someone has a question. All good. Let's do legal. OK. Offhand, uh, first, just like always, no legal medical advice. We're just talking about issues of concern among friends. And um, we had two questions right at the end of the uh, last time I was talking. One uh, said that their spouse was required to be vaccinated to get a green card, which seemed very strange, but took a look at it. And I don't believe that this is exactly right, but it's functionally correct. <clears throat> there was a requirement that if you're gonna fly into the US as a foreign national, that you had to get vaccinated. That was removed um, like a month ago or two. So very recently, until then, if someone didn't have a green card and they went out of the country and coming back in, they would have to be vaccinated in order to get into the country. So if they're going to go get the green card, they're going to have to uh, have a meeting in person. So they have to be in the U.S. and they have to get vaccinated to come in. Well, that requirement went away. OK, so I looked a little deeper and the Immigration Services Office, where you go to get your green card, required vaccinations to be up to date in order to enter the building. And so if you're going to have this in-person uh, uh, meeting, which you have to have to get your green card, you still have to get vaccinated, even though it's shifting. The net result is you really do need to do that. And my recommendation as always is don't fight. Legal battles are long, hard, and ultimately not winnable, particularly against the government. You know, 10 years from now, you might find out you're exactly right and whatever, but you know, you spent hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars and you know, had half of your life thinking about that during the time. It just isn't very good. A lot of the famous legal cases, when I was in law school, someone went back and talked to the people that won the big cases, like uh, the Miranda, for the Miranda warnings. And every single one of the people were worse off than if they hadn't done it. For example, Miranda was uh, put in, in jail and... Um, when they, let him, when they were getting ready to let him out, the police with child welfare went to visit his um, common law wife and said, if you don't immediately agree that uh, he told you that he had committed the crime, we're going to take your kids from you. And so she agreed that and she testified he was reconvicted. He was sentenced to longer than the initial and not given credit for time served. When he got out years later, he and his wife were... Uh, um, not together, imagine that. So, I mean, he, he was within a year of getting out and he got an additional seven years. And it's like, well, he changed the world in the US for warnings, but for him, it was just a horrible, horrible result. So he should have told those uh, um, pro bono lawyers not to help him. I mean, he, he would have been much better off. And so again, with that and other things, I would just say, even if you had a clear-cut case that you could force the government and say you're wrong to ask for that, I would say get the vaccination, get the green card, or don't get vaccination, don't get the green card, but trying to fight it is going to be, I think, worth far worse than, um, than just going on. And again, hopefully if your, your significant other does get a uh, vaccination, they don't get seriously hurt, but there is a chance of that. And someone asked about garbage. This is always a question that people want to know. Um, if you take and you put garbage by the curb, the Supreme Court has said there is no expectation of privacy, so there's no requirement for a search warrant. There is no taking. You're just throwing something away, and if the police want to pick it up and go through it, they can do it anytime they want to. In fact, they said there is also no property interest. So when a third party like the law firm that is fighting your divorce comes in and grabs your garbage and goes through it, the fact you put it out means you have no interest in it at all, and they can do that. The only thing that I'm not aware of is if uh, someone received payment for garbage that was thrown away being recycled, sort of an industry. If you were putting scrap by the side of the road, scrap metal to be picked up, I think if someone came in and grabbed your scrap metal and hauled it away and you lost money, this rule probably wouldn't apply to that. 
So did that answer the questions if the people are here that were concerned about it? Yes. Thank you. Okay. I was told we went too fast before and they wanted us to slow down. So I'll just do a quick review of some of the things that we talked about before and go through it. Remember, people always talk about the Jacobson versus Massachusetts in 1905 case. This was five years into the pandemic. They were looking at uh, vaccinating about 2% of the people. It uh, Someone could argue that it was um, racially motivated, uh, that the Irish were viewed as uh, being a problem. And Jacobson was a pastor that was not an Irishman. He was a resident, but he was, I think, activating. He was interacting with them. And at the end of the day, he did not claim to have any disability when they offered to offered him to do the vaccination or a $5 fine. Now, maybe $200, $500. Also, the uh, court looked at, um, said, you can't second guess the legislature. This law, this rule is no longer there. Um, so part of the reason rationale is completely gone. The courts uh, look at legislation and um, decide second guess the legislature fairly often. Uh, as you remember, he raised 15 grounds and they said his arguments are more numerous than effective. And it's OK if the legislature finds an effective way to do things. And that's pretty much the rule today. And they cited, cited an Encyclopedia Britannica article because this was on a motion for summary judgment. So there hadn't been any discovery and they cited in a New York Court of Appeals case. And the evidence here was they had a 83% lesser infection, 98% lesser deaths. A second case, 99% lesser uh, deaths among uh, less than five-year-olds and 97%. So if we have a case today where someone wants to cite it, factually, if we have a vaccination that has a 20%, a 30%, or a minus 10% efficacy, we can say it's we're not talking about the same thing, even though the government may use the same word. So that's uh, what I had on that particular case. And so, we, as I said, it's, they call it a 12B6 motion, which is just a motion for summary judgment that says, basically, assuming everything that you pled was correct, can you get relief? And it's here stated, failure to, to state a claim upon which relief can be granted. So in doing this, they have to assume every favorable development of the facts in discovery and pr putting witnesses on. And if everything is proven just the way you alleged it and you still can't win, they're not going to waste their time trying the case. That's basically what this is. So then we, the people also uh, cite off in this Indiana University, had 90,000 students, 40,000 employees, and at the end there were, um, re, they, they, the university would would win in this motion for summary judgment if they had a reasonable and due process um, vaccine program. Okay, there were. Um, yeah, there were, there were eight students that sued and they had six other vaccination required. Uh, seven of the eight students received a religious waiver and uh, said they qualified for it and might get one. The university said, if someone just says religious, we grant them the waiver. We don't even look at it. And so for someone to come in and say, this is an unreasonable program, no, this was... One could argue it wasn't even a program, it was a suggestion. And so the fact that the court before the trial said, this is okay for Indiana University, again, if we had a uh, an effective program or we had a, a university that was different, that would be fine. And as you also remember, the students um, expert had data from Penn State where the state had evidence from Indiana. So again, if you're a judge and the two witnesses are experts are conflicting and one is in your state and the other is in some other state where you have to say, well, the University of Pennsylvania and Indiana are pretty much, you know, you're not going to do that. So again, this, this people cite this, but this from a legal perspective, uh, I don't think that this case is uh, really worth very much. It, it, it is worth something and it is a beginning, but if we had a, if we, we had a tight fight on something that another university was doing, I don't think they could rest that the Indiana University case is a carte blanche to do something unless they adopt a program that says, hey, mention religious waiver, you get out. 
in which case, why would anyone sue? So I don't, I don't know why these students were suing. Uh, in this case, it seems like there's something else going on. And the students were also only focusing on the students and the university was focusing on their employees and also the community. And so the students had, had nothing that said that the university's program was irrational in terms of protecting the whole, um, the, the employees and the uh, city in which the university was located. So again, very poorly argued for the uh, students. There might've been a very good reason, but I'm just saying, at the end of the day, the judge really didn't have mu much of a chance to decide another way. I think this went on appeal as well, but um, yeah, that was, um, so anyway, that's, those are those two cases. And uh, th these are the slides I had originally. So there's a bunch of things. And they also found that the vaccination campaign had markedly cur curbed the pandemic. So if we have a case where that isn't occurring, like today, you can argue this, this, this court was looking at a completely different situation than we have today. So again, I would say that we shouldn't view these cases as uh, restricting uh, rights. They also said a future case might raise issues under whether a medical exemption should be granted, but no one asked for a medical exemption. No one denied one. They're not gonna give a, a, an opinion on a case that isn't in front of them. So again, any questions on any of that? Here I move on to next one. So far, so good. Okay, let's talk about Paul Merrick's case. Uh, nothing has happened. Again, nothing has happened. They uh, This case came up on a motion for summary judgment, and what normally happens is they'll have discovery. This is against the government. The government is very big, very powerful, very slow. And Paul and his lawyers, um, uh, the... Uh, Boyden Gray law firm um, are very good and they will fight hard to find everything they can on it if this case continues and it will just take a long time. And so nothing has happened on it, which is exactly what I thought. But again, so, uh, sorry for the interruption. So the appellate court had said, had granted them the appeal. So then the, the case goes back to the district court. Yeah. What? No, let me get, back up. 12 v 6 the, the lower court said, even if everything you said is true, you can't possibly win. I'm dismissing your case. The Court of Appeals said, not so fast. They might win. Go ahead. Have the trial. You know, Do the discovery. Do your work. We're not going to throw it out and saying that Paul Merrick and uh, Robert Asper and all the folks uh, are, are so off base that we shouldn't even entertain it. So now and they so Go do the they work. They are resuming their work. Right. And if you remember, we were looking at the argument in the um, Court of Appeals and the FDA lawyer in trying to avoid this reversal that occurred said, FDA, CDC have no power to prohibit used drugs. They can't prohibit it. They didn't prohibit it. Off-label use is fine, 30 to 40%. These, these are all the things that I said back when this occurred. And it's like, the CDC doesn't seem to be following it. Well, now they're arguing they were. They were just misunderstood. They were just joking around. <laughs> they're not licensed to practice law. They can't insert themselves into a patient relationship. Got and it. They, they asked for attorney's fees. But other than that, they've already gotten every single thing they wanted. Sovereign immunity is not a bar to this lawsuit. You know, they got all of it. They've won. Now, it, probably for Paul, just like I was talking about, Gideon, it doesn't seem like he's won much. He's lost an awful lot in this. But in history, people might look at this and say, oh, Mr. Dr. Merrick, he won everything. It was a slam dunk. Well, no, it's difficult. And that's why I always urge, and when I have an opportunity to be involved in litigation, I pass it up. Had a, um, I remember a DC cab driver that drove over my foot, and I got him to back up, and my foot was fine. So, but, but, but if I don't file the paperwork, you can't file suit. Don't worry, I'm not going to. <laughs> but anyway, so I'm just saying, now, what's really going to be important, I think, maybe not so much for Paul, uh, and he may lose his medical license because, as I understand it, he, wasn't, he didn't have the requisite uh, education to be licensed in the U.S., and they granted it to him based on his extraordinary nature, and they may take that away. He's not going to be able to sue and second guess the, the board taking that away at any time. He was always at risk just because 
it was a special dispensation because he was such a great physician with background to bring him in. And anytime they wanted to take it away, um, you know, the, the courts are very reluctant to get involved. The fact he really didn't have a right to it. Um, I, you know, hopefully they don't, but I'm just saying, even with all this going forward, I don't think that'll make any difference in what his licensing board wants to do. But for the other folks who may be able to sue saying they shouldn't have been fired, well, I, I don't think that's going to work either because they're going to say, look, you had to go to the Court of Appeals to figure out CDC couldn't do these things. We were based it on, you know, we, we were just like you. We thought CDC said, stop it. We're just, we were reasonable, even though we were wrong, we were reasonable. So, you know, CDC says we're, we're government, we we could only be sued if we do really outrageous things. Uh, personally, they're not going to get that. They're probably not going to get whatever. But what we are going to get is in future things, no one's going to be able to say, I'm relying on a CDC tweet. I'm relying on their advertisement. And so he's helped the world, but I don't know. If, I think this is probably going to be one of those things where he may not be helping himself very much. And he may very well may. And if, I were his lawyer. I don't know all. I don't know nearly all that his lawyers do. But if I were his lawyer, I would seriously think about telling him, "You've already won. You've put in ten percent of the work that it's going to take, and you've got ninety percent of the things. You've got a victory right now in the Court of Appeals. Do you really want to go back to this federal judge that ruled against you the first time and see if he can find some way to narrow this? No, just walk away. That's what I would be telling him. And so again, this whole thing may get dismissed." and may get settled out or whatever. They may go and say, look, you know, I had half a million dollars or $5 million of legal fees. If you give me $10,000, we'll, we'll say we're done. You know, who knows? But I'm just just saying, looking at this, I see this as, 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 once again, Paul's done a great thing for society. I don't know how much it's benefited him, but he and the other folks have gone and gotten this thing pounded flat. So again, I haven't seen anything new on that. Uh, I don't expect to see anything new for a while. Um, the next thing, and the, the, these cases are very, very slow because for good reason, prisoners in jail that are asking to say, where well, I'm illegally put in jail, um, they get priority. Criminal cases get priority. Um, we don't have enough judges to handle things. So regular cases take a long, long time. I mean, a long time. I mean, you heard my words, but you didn't understand me. I got hired into the company I worked for, and we had a case that had been argued at the Court of Appeals and was waiting for um, decision. They're still waiting for it. They've had it assigned to, I think, three or four judges who have retired or died in office. What are the odds a judge is going to say, hey, let me take up that old case and spend time looking, figuring it out? No, it's not going to happen. Well, if they go in and poke the judge and say, judge, you need to look at that. This is an old case you've gotten, whatever. The judge will say, well, you know, I can give you a no pretty quickly. So the case just sits there. This isn't that bad because it's real people working. It's not two companies fighting over money. But again, sometimes the courts take an incredibly long period of time. There was another case that went to the Texas Supreme Court where someone was trying to throw a guy out of his um, apartment complex. And this was not what you're thinking, this is the guy that had the washing machines and dryers. He had a lease. The lease had two years to run and he bought it and he tried to throw him out early. It's been 20 years. He's been to the Texas Supreme Court twice. And they said, I know this has taken a long time. All we can do is send it back down. Okay. And again, so just, you know, Courts sometimes can do great things, and sometimes they they don't. Um, I'll give you one more U.S. case. People know the Brown versus Board of Education of Topeka, Kansas, a desegregation case. But what most people don't know is the case was reopened 20 years later, I think, some 20 years later. Brown married Smith, lived in the same house. Her kids went to the same integrated school system. Basically, what Topeka, Kansas said is, yeah, you said all deliberate speed. We're going to move with all deliberate speed. We built a whole bunch of schools, and the way we're going to desegregate is not by busing, but by building schools in the border of the um, 
areas that are segregated and then they'll just naturally integrate. And the district court says, yeah, that's okay. And she went back to the Supreme Court and they said, oh, hard to say the Court of Appeals was wrong. The district court was being reasonable. So anyway, she changed everything, but for her family, nothing. Because she had already graduated before the case came. So there wasn't anything for her and nothing for her kids. And so again, cool. um, this is part so of- what is next? Yeah, so the next one, uh, the DOD cases. DOD COVID cases are different from most people say. Information and belief, that means I didn't look up the reg myself, but I talked to some of the physicians that were um, managing it. So I figured they probably know what the rules are that they're operating under. And even if I would interpret them differently, those are the rules that the DOD was operating under. The DOD apparently cannot require non-FDA approved medical treatment. And so soldiers are told, do this, do that almost all the time. This time they came in and said, oh my gosh, this is an emergency use approval. We can't order you to do it. We'd like to ask you to take this medical treatment. So guess what the soldier's first reaction is? I can say no, I'm going to say no, go away. And that's where all this came. And then they turned around and said, oh, okay, DOD can't ask you to do it. Now um, we're going to tell you to do it and your chain of command is ordering you to do it. And I say, well, but I have a medical thing that says you can't order me to do it while the chain of command is. Now it's not a fight over COVID vaccine. It's a fight over following chain of command. And so when the military dismisses somebody, as they have, and the issue has gone away because it was approved, and there's now federal legislation that prohibits DOD from requiring COVID vaccines, although they can require anything else. Um, but the military says, I'm not going to reinstate these people. Well, why not? Well, they didn't follow chain of command. It doesn't matter what order they weren't following. I don't want someone that I can't trust to follow commands. So that's what's going on with the DOD cases. And so this whole DOD vaccination and the emergency youth authorization is way different in the military in the U.S. than it is for the civilians. Got it. Thank you. So we have a suit, uh, George Watts estate versus DOD. Their family sued DOD for willful misconduct. We'll talk about why they said willful misconduct. And it led to the death of their son, who was 24. It's just a complaint. They haven't even had a ruling on the 12B6 or anything else. This is PR. We're filing a lawsuit. Apparently, their son, George, wanted to attend classes in person. Now, I don't know if these were DOD uh, classes or whether he was at um, very often DOD will take officers and they'll rotate them into civilian uh, schools where they get a master's degree in international relations or something like that. So it may well have been that he was uh, put over on, um, you know, that he, he was at a place where he was attending a university as a rotation out of actually being um, dealing with his military job. And um, he wanted to attend classes in person. I don't think it was a DOD requirement, but I think they they were telling him to do it. And then also he chose Pfizer and had just recently gotten FDA complete approval. So this is not a case of DOD telling him he had to do it. This is a case of George wanting to do it. This is all according to the press release and the complaint. His first dose, he got blood in his urine and he went back and got a second dose. He had a puffy face, a cough. He went to the ER. They said, no, sinus infection. We will test you for COVID. You don't have COVID. And told him to be patient. He went back to the ER later and said, hey, I, I still have this. Yeah, sometimes it takes a long time to get rid of a sinus infection. And later he was coughing up blood, had pain in his feet, hands, and teeth. He was sensitive to sunlight. And after all that, the complaint said, his dad said, oh, when I get off work, I'll take you back to the ER. He died in his room before then. The autopsy said he died from COVID vaccine-related myocarditis. Oh, that's sad. So this is somewhat similar to the Agent Orange and depleted uranium suits where they say, oh, okay, we had these people fighting in the combat zones and whatever, and Joe's dead, and Fred lost his arm, and this person lost their eye, but this other guy 
doesn't think you can remember as well as they used to, and we're going to try to recover for that. And so we've had these kind of lawsuits go on. I'm not trying to minimize them, but saying we've had these kind of things going on. We aren't having a war, but we're still having people that having things, chemicals, drugs, whatever applied, and um, they're complaining about it. So those suits took an awful long time before they started moving forward very much at all. And I don't think that this is really going to be very successful. I'm glad you're I'm glad your son was was not uh, did not follow along the George Watts route. Now, we wanted to talk, I think a number of people want to understand better the PERP Act. Hmm, PERP. That's like what the police call bad guys, right? I don't know why they thought that was a good title for an act, but they did. First at sunsets, October 1st, 2024, unless it gets renewed. It will get renewed. It covers thing other things than just COVID, but it does include COVID. And it says, except for willful misconduct, a covered person, the person that's protected, is immune from lawsuits and liability. And if we go back, they're alleging willful misconduct because they're trying to say, we're not we're trying not to have this perp act work on us. All claims and losses from the administration or use of a covered countermeasure and the COVID-19 vaccine is. So is smallpox and so is uh, a number of others that are primarily used by the military and folks going um, overseas. In March, 2020, the secretary issued a PERP Act declaration covering COVID-19 tests, drugs, vaccines, distributors, states, localities, licensed healthcare professionals, and others identified by the secretary or qualified persons. There've been seven amendments to it to expand the list of protected people, non-traditional or certified licensed health professionals, because they remember they were trying to get the COVID vaccine out as quickly as they could. And they had chiropractors included and retired professionals that are coming back to do it and you know, on and on and on. Healthcare students, you know, hey, your first day of medical school, let me show you how to inject somebody. You know, um, yeah, we set this up. We can argue whether Congress did it right or not, but Congress did it and it's going to be very difficult to overturn it. They also put in the Countermeasures Injury Compensation Program, CICP. Uh, nope. Uh, yeah, Pfizer said it's going to take 75 years. The judge uh, laughed at him and said, you're a moron. That's not going to happen in my court. And uh, so, yeah, stuff will come out sooner, but it will take a while. That wasn't even a good try. I, I, I just, the bad lawyering to say it's going to take us 75 years to get this stuff out was just very poor rationale. What they said was, uh, so I remember, we have, you know, 47 terabytes or whatever of data to go through. We have four people working on it. Each person covers uh, one megabyte a day. So dividing this out is going to take us 75 years to respond. And... The whole idea that, oh, my gosh, I am in a lawsuit and have a discovery requirement. I'm going to keep the same assets I had dedicated to discovery beforehand is just silly. It never happened. I mean, anyway, yeah, it got a lot of press and it was it was stupid PR, I think. And I would never have agreed to allow that legal advice to go out. OK, and the Countermeasure Injury Compensation Program is a special program. It has a one year statute. So one year from the date that whatever occurred, that you had a test, you had whatever, you have to file a claim. There's two types of injuries. One are tabled injuries, which means they're listed in the table. If it's a table injury, then it's presumed it was caused. And you just it's like workman's comp. You lost a finger, you get you know, $5,000. You lost a hand, you get $10,000. You know, just look up table and off you go. And this makes a lot of sense. For example, um, the data isn't right, but if, for example, a polio vaccine, if you said, oh my gosh, polio is a horrible disease. We have a vaccine and it is 
very effective, but one out of 30,000 kids gets really sick or dies. Okay, have the legislature uh, figure out how much compensation and say, we're doing it. We know someone's going to get hurt. We don't know who. And when you come in, your kid died. It was within 10 days of it. Okay, you know, off we go. This is the money. No lawsuit, no nothing. We're, as a society, deciding in order to facilitate the 30,000 healthy people, we're going to have somebody hurt and we're going to compensate you because this is the appropriate way of doing it. And so this is the same sort of thing. The tabled injuries follow that same idea I had. Again, I'm not trying to say my medical information was right, but just the idea that if these people have looked at it and said, oh my gosh, these measures that go on actually do cause these injuries at whatever rate. And if you have what looks like that injury, off you go. We're not re going to require you to sue for each one. But there, at first, there are no tabled injuries for COVID. The non-table, you only get injuries if the CICP itself determines there is causation. And it has to be based uh, on, <coughs> excuse me, compelling, reliable, valid, medical, and scientific evidence. So if they look at it and decide that they're going to get it, give it to you, they could come back and say, oh, no, I changed my mind. It wasn't on compelling, reliable, valid. It was only based upon most convincing, reliable, valid medical and scientific evidence. So, sorry. So while it doesn't say if it's not table, you won't get it, um, that's probably where most people will end up. And again, a lot of people are looking at the sunset date and say, oh, this is going to go away and we won't have this protection after that. Well, yeah, we probably, we might. Again, depends who's in Congress and what happens. But if nothing happens, October 1st, end of the federal fiscal year, end of October, um, the beginning of the next year. So this is the last year of it. So unless Congress acts, this these prohibitions will go away. And then you can sue under state laws or some other law to say that you've been hurt with uh, COVID. But all the statute of limitations will apply. And just because the government said you can't sue for this time frame, I don't think a state is going to say that the, their five-year statute of limitations was told because the federal government did this. I, that, that would just seem wrong. And Louisiana has a prescription period rather than a, a statute of limitations. And the biggest difference is that if it's interrupted even for a day, it resets. So if someone is a criminal defendant, like the, the, the horrible shooter that we have up in uh, Maine, and they hide out and it's, oh, I hit out for five years, so I'm okay. Well, if the state could prove they were out of the state for one day, they would start their five-year period over again. All right, now we have uh, Smith versus U U.S. Health Resources and Service Administration. Does anyone know what the U.S. Health Resources and Service Administration is? I didn't either. It's the agency that's enforcing this CICP program. That's why they were named first in the U.S. Uh, health and uh, uh, services is, is also the uh, included. And as a federal court in Louisiana, Monroe, Louisiana, that's that's up north, not in the south, down where uh, New Orleans is. And they're alleging CICP violates the Fifth and Seventh Amendments to the Constitution. It's not going to be well received. Uh, we start off with the federal, state, and tribes have sovereign immunity. Um, they can do things themselves or hire contractors, and they often can decide when to waive sovereign immunity. And if they don't, it's not waived. And so they're going to have to come in here and say, mm, yeah, they had sovereign immunity. They could waive it as they like, but they didn't do it, and they're violating these amendments uh, for due process and the like. I think there, this is going to be a very, very difficult thing to go, and I don't think it's going to happen. And I suspect that if this, if the uh, CICP uh, terminates for the new legislation working on smallpox and some of the other ones goes forward and doesn't include COVID, that um, this will be dismissed as moot. Got it. Then we have uh, a lawsuit in uh, California 
where this company, startup company, uh, has having trouble with Moderna making all the money off of stuff they think they stole from them. And the problem that we have here is the general medical and uh, toxicology rule that the dose makes the poison or the drug. And the problem they had is the uh, mRNA treatments that people were using were um, hurting the people and not tolerated and killing the test animals or causing undue problems before they reached a uh, therapeutic dose. And so they had a real problem and had to find a way to kind of limit what the uh, RNA was doing in the body. And that's what these people came up with. Here's the patent. It's a 2014 patent, so it'll continue for some time now. Um, this is a problem for uh, little inventors. They negotiated with a whale and didn't get a sale. Um, often the whale will just take it. And they're going to have a big lawsuit against uh, Moderna. And if Moderna spends a billion dollars on legal fees, is that a game changer for them? No. But for this little company, yeah, that's going to be a problem. The other thing is um, it's usually easy if you see a patent or relatively easy to figure out what the claims are and find a way around the claims. For example, if someone says, I have these four ingredients that are active and uh, we get this result, and someone says, oh, yeah, yeah, I use five ingredients, not the four you said. And you can say, well, I, I should have written the patent to say, I get this result, preferably using four things, more preferably using three, most preferably using concentrations between 50 and 80%. But if they didn't write it like that, and Moderna's lawyers or their people found a way to just move right on the next side of it. The patent is like a, uh, a fence. It protects your property, but someone can get right next to that fence if they want to. Okay. But there is this big lawsuit that's going on. And they said, well, we talked to them and talked to them and they showed them how our stuff worked and we talked to them and they didn't buy anything. And now they came out with a MRA vaccine. And Moderna will say, we didn't want to pay them a licensing fee. We, we understood what theirs was because their patent has to teach it. We talked to it to be sure we fully understood it. And amazingly, our, guy, our research guys came up with another way. I mean, that's what they're going to say. How the case comes out, I don't know. But basically, uh, if you're a little guy, you don't want to do that. A lot of people are finding with Amazon, they're complaining they negotiated with the whale. Their sales started going up and Amazon came in and offered an identical product or a similar product at a lower price and suddenly had trouble with their listing and ran them off. Have the same thing with Apple. Oh, yes, I have all this Apple software I submit. And if it becomes popular, Apple will add a similar thing to their OS. You know, the whole idea that you could take the camera and turn the light on for a flashlight. That was offered by apps for a while and suddenly it became a feature. Sales go down for the app. Okay, that, that's a problem when, you, when you're dealing with someone like that. And um, yeah. The other problem that you run into is um, we have, uh, we, can, we can protect things from being stolen inappropriately as a trade secret. We have copyright law and we have um, patent law. And the Supreme Court has said, except for those protected areas, you're encouraged to take anything you can and develop new stuff. So it's not just tolerated, that's encouraged. And part of the reason is if someone can get outside the patent and compete with you, that gives you more incentive to file for the patent, which will disclose stuff sooner. And so they're seeing if someone misses the patent coverage, you're not gonna nudge it over to cover it. They're gonna say, I guess you should have written a better patent. And we encourage people to write good patents and patent everything because if you don't patent it, they're gonna copy it. So again, there is this intellectual bias against the people that get patents. And also patent is a legal monopoly. And the US tends to view monopoly from an antitrust standpoint as something that's inherently bad. And we just tolerate uh, patent monopolies. And one of the biggest concerns that some have is you have a patent over, let's say shoelaces. 
but the only way I can buy your shoelace is to buy a shoe that I don't want. You have these crappy shoes that you're selling, and rather than a 15, 20 cent shoelace, I've got to buy your $50 shoe. That would be a tying arrangement. You're taking something where you have appropriate power and you're tying it to a market like shoes where you don't, and you're distorting that market. That is illegal. That's per se illegal, which means the court won't even, in an antitrust suit, if they find that that's what you did as a tie, they won't even listen to an explanation that it's pro-competitive or not. It's just once it's there, we're talking about damages. And in patent suits, it's three times the damages plus attorney's fees. So there are no small patent cases. And I'll tell you one other thing. Have you ever wondered why you see these little patent numbers on every sort of device? One of the reasons is in order to get travel damages to start running, you have to show that you gave them notice that the patent was there. So you see the little notice. You also have law firms that write and say, dear sir, you know, hey, dear Apple, I bring to your attention the following US patents. Not gonna threaten, allege anything, I just bring it to you. So starting today, we have proof you had noticed that I have a patent that covers whatever. I'm not gonna try to describe it because that could be viewed as, you know, a tying or trying to build on the patent protection. So you just basically say, I bring to your attention these things. Part of the complaint is we talked to them, we shared the, with them a copy of the patent, and they were doing it to try to say, if you play hard you know, and, and violate the patent and I sue you starting today, I'll get treble damages. And it's interesting, people ask, you know, what are the treble damages? Well, the, the, the statute says it's either three times the profit, three times the harm due to the little company, and they say, oh, I would have built whatever, and I couldn't do that. It's not just the profit from the Ford Motor, the big company, but whatever was built, or three times the sales price. And so anyway, you don't want to lose a patent suit, but uh, I don't think Moderna will lose the patent suit just because the, the whales usually win. You know, there was a guy that won a, a patent suit against... Um, Ford and Chrysler and GM, he, he, he came up with the intermittent windshield wipers, got a patent, they violated, he sued them. 15 years after he died, he won. His kids got some money, but yeah. Uh, this, this may be a similar thing. Even if they win, it will take an incredibly long period of time to do it, I think. They may settle and agree to give them some money to go away or whatever, or if the, if the claim is really good, they might settle and give them a decent thing. But if the lawsuit goes forward, it will, it will take a long time. And I uh, would not hold, hope that the, uh, the inventor is gonna find out that they used his invention and that he gets compensated for it. Any other questions right. about this? No, so far so good. AstraZeneca faces lawsuits also, yes. Rutgers was told by a law firm, again, not even a motion for summary judgment. They says, file the lawsuit, file with the press. They're trying to show, trying to put pressure on AstraZeneca to settle because, oh my gosh, we're suing you because this is a horrible thing and we're trying to, okay. They won't say that's why they're doing it, but that's why they're doing it. We have 50 other clients that are ready to sue you. Well. That means they're talking, it usually means they're talking to 50 people and they may get 10 or five additional suits. In the upcoming months, that means they're not ready to sue or we would have sued a whole bunch right away. And they're apparently claiming under the, this is in the UK, 1987 Consumer Protection and Vaccine Damage Payment Scheme, sort of like the scheme we're talking about in the US and it only allows 120,000 pounds recovery. If severe disenablement is shown, that would be like you're in a coma. So, I mean, if someone loses a hand or loses um, your ability to work or whatever, that's not gonna be the whole 120,000. 120,000 is the worst case, horrible loss that you could have, you know? Someone that has five kids and was, you know, whatever. 120 is the max, so. And this is based on uh, March 6th Freedom of Information request to the uh, UK government, and it says they have 4,017 cases of uh, um, vaccine injury for COVID vaccines that have done 334 deaths. See, 
they're, they're approaching 10% death. And that's because most people don't claim unless they've had a catastrophic loss. 622 are for AstraZeneca, uh, 348 are for Pfizer, and 43 for Moderna, primarily because Moderna didn't have as many doses given. I don't think it shows that they're any safer or any less safe. Anything on that one? All good. Okay, there's another lawsuit in the UK. Unlike the US, they don't have their um, subsidiary groups like states license. They have a national government that is fundamental. And uh, we have um, a federal system where our states do most of the stuff. They have a general medical council, which is a licensing group for all doctors. Well, this junior doctor complained that a senior doctor, I, I guess they divide the doctors into junior and senior based on something. I think when they come out, they're a junior doctor for five, 10 years, and then they became a senior doctor or something. Some, someone in the audience probably knows, but uh, yeah, spike protein was patented decades ago. Uh, it doesn't prove it's unnatural. Now, people patent things that are um, discovered all the time. For, right. for, yeah, so, for example, mathematical formulas can be patented. And it's like, this was inherent in math when it was devised. Yeah, but nobody figured that out. Okay. Um, and sometimes we find brand new ways of doing things. And if you patent it, you can just stop someone from doing it the brand new way, but not the old way. And how do you know which way they really did it? So this junior doctor was concerned that a senior doctor provided contrary medical advice. Apparently, senior doctor thought things different than the junior doctor does, and the junior doctor is wants to correct the senior doctor. That seems a little strange to me, but okay concerning COVID, and it was based, he's concerned about Twitter and other places that didn't specify what, perhaps giving office advice to his the senior doctor's patient, despite substantial evidence for the vaccine's safety. So the junior doctor thought that the vaccine was completely safe and the senior doctor wasn't saying that, and he's upset about it complained to the General Medical Council, they didn't investigate, and now he's suing them to force them to investigate because the, ju the senior doctor didn't give the advice the junior doctor thought was right. Is this the Dr. Asim Malhotra case? I do believe so. mm -hmm. yeah, I think this is that complaint. Yeah. And the senior doctor was employed in an ROC private clinic in London. So I think part of the problem is that he's not being employed by the uh, central government medical thing for everyone. He is in the high priced medical care for just rich people. And he wasn't doing what this junior doctor was doing to all his patients that were coming in that the government was paying for. And those people were complaining that the senior doctor was giving advice different to the junior doctor and wondering why the junior doctor wasn't uh, up to stuff. And now he's upset and wants to try to punish the senior doctor. I would presume something like that happened. In particular, he said the vaccine could harm people and that the vaccine did harm people. Mm, I think we can say any medicine could harm people and almost every medicine that's ever been given did harm some people, particularly if you're giving it to millions of people. The idea that you didn't harm someone inadvertently and a minor harm would seem absurd to me. But that was one of the things he's complaining about. And then apparently there was a 2022 tweet that said, I'm an RNA vaccine, likely contributing factor in all unexpected heart attacks, heart attacks, strokes, uh, cardi cardiac atheremesia, the, the bad rhythm, yes. and heart failure since 2021. I suspect that contrary to the complaint, oh, back up, contrary to the complaint that what he said is this is a likely contributing contributory factor and we should look at it. That's probably what he said. And if he said that, I don't see how you could argue that that wasn't 
proper advice, even if you think it's really safe, you should maybe take a look and figure out if it really is safe or not. Because as we know, most vaccines take over 10 years to be ready. We had the warp speed, whatever, bring it in, protect them from suits, let this go and stop this pandemic right now. And so why would you not be more concerned and to figure out what the actual side effects are? I mean, anyway, I'm I'm feeling more sympathy for the senior doctor than the junior doctor, even based on this article, and that he peddled unscientific and dangerous misinformation. And this sounds like it's just the political um, positioning with uh, what the um, what Twitter used to do and what uh, um, some of the other big. Uh, um, some of the other big uh, computer companies are doing the Google and uh, uh, YouTube, which is part of Google and uh, Facebook and all. These are the, this is the same language that they had, the same language that the Biden administration had, the same language that the FDA is trying to back away from in their appeal. And so, again, I think he's trying to do it. To my way of thinking, this is really good news that the General Medical Council said, no, nah, we're not going to go interfere with what doctors are saying. And we're not going to listen to a junior doctor complaining that a senior doctor said someone might be harmed because we know that it's true. They also said in the press release that they will add others to the lawsuit. Got it. So a uh, quick comment. I see this question a couple of times. So today we are about uh, into an hour now. So maybe not today, but Maybe in a future talk, we can talk about informed consent. So for example, look at this question. And if we can see, does this, what is the commentary about this question in the COVID vaccines context? And maybe we can do some discussion next time about it. Yeah, let, let me, I, we can, let me just say one thing here. To get informed and consent, you have to understand what the risks are. If someone says, I, yeah, Take an absurd case. Lawyers always take absurd cases because it becomes clear what we're arguing. Someone says, hey, I'm going to shoot you a little in the head with this nine millimeters. Is it okay? It, it might cause you some damage. You say, oh, yeah, that's fine. So, unless I tell you what the risks are, you can't agree to it. Oh, you're going to get in a, a cage fight with this guy. But you realize he's he's got two foot longer arm reach and 100 extra pounds on you. No, I didn't. Well, then inform consent won't be there. So it has to be informed that you know what's going on and we can talk about the details. But basically, that's a real concern that if they aren't informing people of the real risks that they, you can't get informed consent. And so that's Bye. all we have. Excellent. Right on the dot. Almost two minutes to the hour. So thank you so much. And Cool Beans, thank you very much. For tomorrow, I have a business meeting to go to at 3.30. <coughs> I don't think I'll be back in time. So I'm going to miss again tomorrow, but I'll see you next week. Uh, Paul, thank you so much for this. You're quite welcome. And see you next time. Cool beans. Uh, bye for now.